incarceration. And I know a lot about, sadly, uh, what happens to families after homicide. So in my survivorship, when I came to this building, I was the only elected that had a sibling in the Mass DOC. And I was visiting my brother often. And because of that, I would go visit him and then people would be screaming my name. Oh, hey, Beth Miranda, like you should talk to me. You should visit me. I'm from Roxbury. And that led me on a journey along with many of my colleagues here of being inspired. Uh, Rep Holmes has been the most consistent um, person who has been visiting the Brothers of the AACC in his entire time he's been here. And it inspired me to visit more and then um, bring other people along, like Rep Erica, who's now a big, big champion. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about this bill, and I want to thank Erica. Let's give it up to Erica. Uh, we talk, we'll acknowledge everyone else in the room, but she has receipts. I've never seen someone go to the DLC with a whole packet. Uh, I'm good with my lived experience and my words, but she came with the receipts. Um, but I want to give special thanks to the Black and Latino Caucus Chairman, uh, Bud Williams, for championing this bill as well. Give it up. Racism, not 
process, the racism standards established, that would have the power to investigate any aspect of the day-to-day -day operations or conditions of correctional facilities. We hear a lot from legislators that say to us, this is our job. Um, but in the five years I've been here, it's too much. And it needs to be independent and it needs to be more inclusive of, of different members of our society, particularly those that have had the lived experience. Because every day, I shared yesterday that I get about uh, three to four emails or calls or asks for Zoom from people who are actually incarcerated and their families. And I have a busy district. And so in order for us to really hold these people in the care and custody and be able to address the harm that we're seeing being caused, we need a special office to be able to handle this. Four, the division would have the authority to impose fines to demote correctional officers and administrators and limit correctional officers to staff interactions with incarcerated persons throughout investigation to prevent something we hear a lot about, which is retaliation. Uh, we hear a lot, like when we go visit, if someone calls us and there's an email, uh, the DOC tells us there's no retaliation. But we know better than that because then you can't visit a person or the person is sadly in a certain unit that you can't attend um, because of the way that they're communicating with us. And five and six, that the division would have the power to disclose information to the public without the need for a public records request. The results of such investigations will be made public by reports available to the public and lawmakers. And lastly, the division would be tasked with enforcing the prohibition of retaliation. So enforcement is the big deal here. Now, there's other experts in the room that will share more details as they go along, but I wanna thank everyone for being here today. And I wanna end with saying we have a crisis in our commonwealth. And I think it's a crisis of moral aversion, one where our incarcerated loved ones have been dehumanized, and a result of barbaric conditions and racialized abuse have been perpetuated in our state prisons. And they've gone unnoticed and brushed under the rug for far too long. Now we have the actual moment where the Black and Latino Caucus members and the Criminal Justice Reform Caucus are working together to ensure that we not only visit prisons regularly, but we're working with our incarcerated loved ones. And so I wanna thank you all for being here today. And next on the agenda, I'm gonna cut my rest of my comments short, is I am gonna bring Senior Attorney Whiteside to offer an even better bill overview and background to the race and data component. Everyone put your hands together. Thank you so much, Senator. Um, I, I really want, also considering that we're running a little over time, I, I want to be able to actually touch upon some of the background to how the bill came to fruition and some of the experiences that I've had as an, a prisoner rights advocate with PLS. Um, my organization initially, we, our focus wasn't primarily on race equity issues. I realized that that was a prevailing issue within the department. There was a lack of race equity, a lack of racial data, and there was no way of tracking that information. Um, in uh, 20, after 2020, George Floyd, we, we were able to put the REIPI team together, and our first task was to actually survey all of the black and brown prisoners throughout the state of Massachusetts, and we were successful in collecting 547 surveys. From what we, the data that we collected from the surveys, we realized that every aspect of the day-to-day -day operations um, within corrections, black and brown prisoners were adversely impacted. The issue, however, was again that there was no data to support that finding other than the surveys that we have provided. So I um, served as a commissioner on this special commission, legislative commission uh, for structural racism in corrections. And another issue that we again ran into was the lack of data. We had to primarily rely on a lot of quantitative data, a lot of testimonies, and even with that information, it was severely curtailed by uh, the, the Department of Corrections. So I really want to um, actually start with uh, quotes from former Representative Anika Eliogardo and Senator Eldridge, if I may. Um, these quotes were published in the December 22 final report. Uh, I'll start with Senator Eldridge's words. I recognize that eliminating racial disparities and dismantling structural racism within our correctional facilities is just one of many reforms that need to be implemented to create a more just criminal justice system in Massachusetts. 
and Representative, former Representative Mika L. Ibarra states, today's prisons are an unacceptable substitute for true rehabilitation and restoration. You enter and leave restored and ready to reintegrate. Victims are not served by the current model. Correctional officers are not served by it. Overlay the normalization of structural racism and the results are not only counterproductive, but also unfair and unjust for communities of color across the Commonwealth. We need to build a better way, one that truly aligns to our corrections mission to rehabilitate and prepare people for healthy reentry into communities and one that safely and transparently equips and honors the first responders who serve to carry out that mission. I thought that these quotes were really important because it really speaks to the heart of the bill. Even no matter how you, you fare in terms of your opinions regarding the Department of Corrections and their role, this bill is really about dismantling structural racism. And I think that that's something that we can all agree exists. It not only uh, is ingrained and embedded into uh, corrections, but every aspect of our society, honestly. And so I think with that understanding that because this is such a complex issue, we need to start developing tools that will actually move us beyond simply acknowledging that structural racism exists to something actionable. And this particular bill would allow us to do that starting with the very most basic thing, which is collecting substantive racial demographics. Right now, the Department of Corrections only collects data in three areas, population trends, crime trends, and very minimal information regarding solitary confinement. So where that leaves us is a huge information gap when it comes to the day-to-day -day operations. We don't know how black and brown prisoners are faring when it comes to education, when it comes to access to health care, when it comes to access to mental health, disciplinary proceedings, uh, proceedings visitation, canteen, the list is limitless. We, we don't have any data to, to point to whether or not there are particular policies that are adversely impacting black and brown prisoners. And so as uh, Senator Miranda mentioned, this bill would not only allow for a, a very a rigorous data collection system. It would also allow for the independent collection of that data. Um, uh, within the surveys, we uh, had a lot of prisoners who notated that they, their identities, their ethnicities were misidentified and skewed. And so we can't even rely on the information that DLC has collected to determine whether or not uh, the particular populations are accurate within the facility. So independence is something really important. Another key part of the bill that I, I really think is important is that we're allowing a lot of the power to be placed within the communities and within those, within the uh, populations of people who are directly impacted. And I think that we don't see that enough in politics. We don't see that enough within organizations. And that's something that is really key. These individuals are experts of their own experiences and it's high time that they are not only acknowledged as such, but they're actually compensated. And that's something that the bill would also do. The bill would allow the creation of a community council, which would be comprised of formerly incarcerated individuals, impacted family members, those who have expertise in structural racism, as well as in individuals uh, within community organizations who work directly with impacted persons. Um, I, I, I really, uh, just to close out, I, I think that another thing that is really important to note is that oversight. Oversight is, is something that I, I know there's been a number of oversight bodies that have been created within the state of Massachusetts, but none with true enforcement power. A lot of those oversight bodies only have the authority to uh, submit recommendations, which is what our commission uh, was able to do. And a lot of the, the recommendations that we put out, they're still not being followed. And I think that that's true with the CJRA and a number of other uh, commissions that have uh, been, been tasked and been charged with reviewing issues within the Department of Corrections. We're seeing that those recommendations are not being carried out. So this bill would actually allow us to begin to sanction DOC for the failure to, to follow and adhere to our recommendations and to any investigative findings. Uh, the bill would also allow individuals who are identified as bad actors, correctional population members, who are identified as bad actors to be demoted and removed from population, as well as being able to interact with uh, currently incarcerated persons' property. 
which is something that uh, we receive reports regarding that on a daily basis at PLS, and it's very limited action that we, we are able to uh, provide for prisoners, so that's something else that the bill would, would allow for. And uh, finally, um, another key entity is, I don't know if everyone knows, but PLS, we're, we're kind of viewed as the watchdogs of DLC. We're, oftentimes, anytime there is an issue with PLS, Legislators reach out to us, other community organizations reach out reach out to us, and really the, the truth of the matter is our authority, our power is very limited. We are a very small staff of about 22 individuals, including administrative support. We do not have the, the ability or the capability or the resources to be able to file suit against DOC for everything that, for every report that we receive. And so a lot of times we're left writing advocacy letters DOC does not respond to our advocacy letters, and if they do, it's um, putting it nicely, they're just telling us to mind our own business. So a lot of times the advocacy that we are, are tasked with doing is not as effective as we would like, and so one of the powers of the I Dare You office would, they would be is that they would allow us to confer, they would be able to confer their powers onto PLS and onto other organizations that are similarly situated. So I think that's really key because we'd be able to go in and actually um, uh, carry out investigations. We'd be able to talk to more than just one prisoner at a time. Um, we'd be able to go in and speak to prisoners in groups and be able to uh, inform them of their rights. And um, I think that that's also really key to being able to move this work forward. Um, so um, I think I'll end there and I will bring up um, Representative, uh, <laughs> I thank you all so much for, for having me. Um, and I'm very excited to be here. My name is Rep. Erica Eierhoven. I represent the 27th Suffolk, uh, Suffolk Mont Middlesex District in Somerville. Um, and uh, I just want to shout out um, Liz, actually, who brought me to the very first visit at, at MCI Framingham in my first term. Uh, I know Rep. Keith, you were there as well with other women's caucus members. And since then, I've spoken to over 80 women at MCI Framingham, which is a good percentage of that population. But the, thing, <laughs> the thing that really stuck out with me on that first visit, though, I actually grew up 10 minutes away from MCI Framingham and about 15 minutes away from MCI Concord in this town called Wayland. Um, and what was upsetting to me, what really hit me um, particularly, is how invisible prisons were. Growing up right nearby, I had no idea that this was happening. A lot of the women I had met with were there when I was in school, right, at MCI Framingham, when I was growing up. Um, and it really strikes the core for me. I know we're here with the you know, REICI, I appreciate all the work, because all this does fundamentally lead into issues of racism, white supremacy, and what brings me to this work as an Asian American um, is that we are often rendered invisible, and so that invisibility is the injustice that I cannot tolerate. Um, that is what brings me to the DOC, brings me to advocate for our prisoners. And so that's been sort of my journey through all of this. And um, I support this bill because frankly, I'm tired. This, this work is exhausting, it is hard. Um, the, I cannot tell you how much pushback we get, how much retaliation we face as legislators, um, how much of this like back and forth and just grinding every day. And then I'll just say too, in particular, right, as you and like Liz, you mentioned how like, you know, you kind of go into prisons and you meet more and more people. And actually I start off with Framingham and then start to go to now five other facilities. So now I cover six facilities that I go into or at least meet with incarcerated people regularly. It's hard to say no to these dire concerns that they bring to you. And I actually made this New Year's resolution that I was gonna have a little more balance. I was gonna be able to like, you know, <laughs> try not to act like I have 40 hours in the day. Um, and then literally like a week later, there was a guy who lit his cell on fire out of desperation in the SAU at Susan Baranowski. Uh, this is the same unit that has had multiple instances of mass tear gassing of men inside their unit. Um, I know PLS has five to seven open cases of brutality from the same individual, so they're getting retaliated repeatedly. Um, they went on hunger strike earlier this fall. Uh, we urge, and I just want to thank all my colleagues who were supportive on this, urging the Attorney General to please investigate, but that, right, you can't just go, Oh, I'll just put that aside for now, 
right? And so that's what makes this work so difficult, and this is why I support this bill, because we need this support. It is so hard for even one or two or three, or even, again, we have so many legislators here who do so much hard work, their staff do hard work, it's not enough. Um, and so I just wanted to uplift some of the systemic issues, because I really try to put these into systemic concerns, because we hear this from, again, we've been in touch with, my office has probably been in touch on a one-on-one -on -one basis with over 150 incarcerated individuals, and this is what they brought up to me. Um, and so I just wanted to share that these are some of the systemic data requests that I have put in place um, and asked the DOC for. Specifically, I started with education and programming. We had a meeting with the Criminal Justice Reform Caucus last fall in healthcare as well as the parole board. Um, you'll notice that the five requests, and now I can't count the self-improvement groups, I submitted that yesterday, but um, everything else, right, that we have not heard back from the DOC. I have heard back from the parole board for some two and a half months that they have gotten us some of the data moving forward on it. But this is the kind of like timeline that we're operating on as legislators. Um, Aaron, next slide. Yes, okay, so this is what we get. I just wanna zoom in on education and programming because that's just, I just wanna highlight one example when we dive into one issue, what it looks like. This is the program description booklet. You don't need to read the details on it, but that is what the DOC provides the legislature and the public. And if you look at it, I had a woman who had been incarcerated for over 15 years and multiple women review these program offerings. They are providing to us false information. Half of these programs do not exist. The ones that they list off are actually one program that they're pretending is six programs, but it's only one. Um, and then also we have some that they're saying, I've never even heard of this in my entirety of my incarceration. So some of them will say, never heard of, never heard of. Some of them are only available to, by the Catholic chaplaincy. Like, I mean, these all of these problems. And again, this is information that the DOC shared with us. And that's something that every visit I had with, um, at, in prisons, I asked the administrators, because they do sit down with us and answer our questions in a very vague way. So I said, can you send me all the programs you have running in each facility? Can you send me the enrollment numbers? I never got it. After two years of trying, I never got it. So what I did was I worked with the incarcerated brothers and sisters who formed self-improvement groups that then provided me that information. So we go to the, uh, actually, go one more slide. This is Susa Baranowski. Again, meager offering, inaccurate. Uh, next slide. Okay, so this is finally, I had to get the information from the ground. I did not get it from the DOC. I had to collect it from all the brothers and sisters behind the wall. This is all of the higher education enrollment and degree programs available at the DOC. There is only 113 out of almost 6,000 incarcerated people who are in a higher education program. Um, I would say about three, almost a little under 3,000 is eligible. Uh, next slide. And that, by the way, is all free higher education provided by Tufts, EC, and Emerson. So if we go to the next slide, this is what DOC provides. They have a lower enrollment number, you'll see the full amount is 93, but that is the limited vocational programming available across only these six facilities. There's culinary, barbershop, cosmetology, welding, building trade. They tell us about all these amazing programs they have, and the reality is it's available to four men in Concord. Nine men in Concord there, right? The different ones, nine, six men for Norfolk. Um, four women in culinary. So all in all, despite the fact that the DOC spends $16 million a year on programming, this is all we have to show the entirety for vocational. I don't have it for the other facilities because the DOC hasn't provided me that information. Um, next slide. All right, and then this is, comes back to parole, right? Because these are all connected between how do we get people to re-enter successfully. This is the course offerings we have for all the courses that the parole board asked for, from restorative justice, parole preparation, Alcoholics Anonymous, I could go on. They are not available, none of them are available at Susan Baranowski. Almost all of them aren't available at Shirley. But you can see all the gray means it's not available. And the white is available. So this is how we're doing the service, just in education. This is why it's taken two years to even get this information. You yes. how that impacts the home service. Well then the parole board will ask them, have you done Alcoholics Anonymous? And they have to say no. And then the other thing I'll say too, because I know Liz, you and I have you know, written letters in support of people's parole. The lawyers who support people who are upper parole have to figure out how do we spin this narrative? Because you don't want to make it sound like you're making excuses. But the reality is these programs don't exist. So they have to be the one to communicate to the parole board, we don't have, I, I never had this opportunity to begin with, or I've been on the wait list for 10 years. But that's, that onus goes on the guy who's up for parole. And they can't, 
yeah, there's no clear way to do it. It's, and that they have to communicate that. And what was shocking to me was Commissioner Michi said to me, I don't know what parole wants. How do you not know that? And the parole board said, I don't know what DOC offers. So that's what we're dealing with. Um, yeah, any other questions about parole? Okay, next slide, sorry, I'm out of time. So I gotta hurry. <laughs> All right, this is adult-based education. This is higher high school graduation. The thing I wanted to take away from this is those numbers are damn low, and the fact that they've dropped because they moved. This is since the 2018 criminal justice bill was passed. These graduation numbers have dropped because they put everything on tablets. They don't do in-person teaching in most of the facilities. So that's why the graduation rates have gone down. And this is something I wanna highlight because people assume everything's kind of going in the right direction for us. It's not, it's going in the wrong direction, particularly with high school graduation. Um, next slide. And then the last thing I wanna leave with is on classification. I know um, Matt from uh, REICI had a good presentation with GBH is an amazing article about how one in five people are released from Massachusetts prisons from maximum security facilities. This is the classification level you are released from um, over time. So you can see we've gone in the wrong direction where fewer, more and more people are being released from maximum security and even in the past 10 years, we've cut in half who gets released from pre-release centers. So again, we're going the wrong direction. This is a consequence of us not having data and be able to conduct oversight as a legislator or any government body. Um, next slide. And finally, I can't not say this, but this is what we're seeing with racial disparities, right? This is a very limited um, data that we're able to get on race. I, I just put it, kept it simple with um, black versus white, um, pre-release versus maximum security. There's an overwhelming number of uh, black, and brown, black and brown people in maximum security versus in pre-release. And I know that um, you'll hear from the lived experiences of people who have had to go through the re-entry process, how much they've had to fight to get out from a pre-release. This is, again, what races make up these different, um, you know, different facility security levels. And then next slide. Okay, yeah, um, I'm gonna skip that because I think we're out of time. But I just wanna say thank you all so much for your time. I'm gonna call up, um, we're gonna have, hopefully, Fuquan join us over Zoom. So hopefully, we'll tech check. We're good? Okay, yeah, amazing. Sure. So we're gonna, we're actually really honored to have um, Ricky Fuquan McGee uh, join us from MCI Norfolk to talk about his experience. Um, we're also joined by David, um, who is a formerly incarcerated. He's currently a student at Tufts University, um, but he was in MCI Concord in the Tufts program, so he was one of those 113 you saw earlier. Um, and then we also have Jackie, who is a, a family member, you know, a partner of some. She's not here. Oh, okay, we're gonna skip Jackie. But we're at David. Oh, she's here. Yeah, yeah, she's over here. Okay, so Jackie is gonna join us um, as a yeah family member. Well, so Juan is not home. DLC is halting you. Oh. What? So there's no. Get the report because he's not allowed. DLC is not allowing him to join us. Uh, yes. Right. So, Another prime example. Yeah. So I just wanted to say to you, I'm sorry, I just have to say this and then let's bring up Jackie and, and David. Um, like, when we were talking about retaliation earlier about what incarcerated people face, we as legislators face this all the time. Um, I showed up unannounced two Saturdays ago to sue the Baranowski after that fire. I had never had an issue with getting incarcerated people to participate in CJRC briefings or the Black and Latino Caucus briefings or really for any of these briefings until this event. Um, for REICI, so I just have to like uplift that that is, this was a big surprise to me that this happened, that they were not permitting the group that we had requested, even though we had given them notice and done all the things that they asked us to do. So that's, I just, you're seeing this live right now with what happens with what we do. So, all right, should we go David and, and Jackie, come on up. Back and they're like, hey, I need you to change this. And they're like, no, we can't. 
just absolutely like refused to change my like allow me to self-identify as my race, my ethnicity. I ran off with that. So then employment is a very difficult thing. Like for a man of color to be able to attain a job that is below a dollar a day, that is like anything above that standard rate, it's damn near impossible. <clears throat> so I caught a break. I ended up getting an administrational job, record department, it's in an administrational building, so I'm getting to mingle with people who are staff members, I'm getting to feel a little bit human, I get a pay boost, so I'm like, oh, I'm good. One day an officer walked up to me, hey, the valley, yeah, here's my ID, yeah, get out the door. No explanation, no ticket, no disciplinary report, nothing. Lose my job. One of my coworkers ends up getting into a physical altercation, gets his job right back. The only difference between me and him, I happen to be a person of color, and he wasn't. I end up furthering my, myself, whatever, brushed it off, kept going. I end up getting into Tufts. So while I'm in Tufts, I end up staying out of trouble. So because I stayed out of trouble, my points end up coming low, I end up qualifying for a, a minimum security prison. But I wanted to stay and continue my education. They're telling me, no, you have to go to a minimum security prison and you have to take Correctional Recovery Academy. I'm like, I never had any drug addiction problems. I'm not an addict, I don't need Correctional Recovery Academy. I should have the autonomy to say, I want to educate myself and I want to remain at Concord. I had the board vote for me to stay. I wrote everybody in administration. I wrote everybody in administration in my building. I wrote downtown. Classification comes back to hell, you leave. I refuse a move. I end up going into to segregation. I come back out. I'm like, okay, I'm going to go to class. I end up going to class. A group of correctional officers come in to Valley. We got a call. You're being kicked out of school. Lost my entire education, but there was another man in my class who a month before did the exact same thing. Refused his move and got to stay in class, was never removed. The only difference between me and him, I was a person of color, and he wasn't. So there's so many like underlying details and it's, it's become a culture. It's like, if you're a black man in prison, you're less human than a white guy in prison. Mm. And this is a trend that needs to stop. And the oversight that needs to be done and the controlling of the data, we need to go in and do this, whether it's independently, because they're never going to give us the true data. You see, people are asking, like, somebody has to go about it. You're like, I work a nonprofit and I do program management, and half my job is to collect data and send it out to an independent entity to make sure that the programming that these kids in Rockford are getting is the quality that I said it was. Mm -hmm. So, why doesn't the DOC have to hold himself to that same standard? Somebody should be. Looking, up, looking over the data and everything that's happening on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not just paint with a broad brush. It's no, we have to look into education. We have to look into employment. We have to look into their visitation. We have to look into how they're eating. Because everybody isn't getting the same treatment. And it's just based on the discrepancies of the people that's there. Nobody's, nobody's explaining why. I'm asking, can I get an explanation why? Nobody not once ever told me, they couldn't give me a reason because they didn't want to say it's structural racism. That's what's happening. And yeah, I'm just, thank you guys for having me. I just, thank yeah, you. we need to shine light on these issues. Appreciate you. Appreciate you.
I'm just going to take one moment to just pull up what I wrote for you all today, because usually I do do this from the heart. But there was a lot of statistics and data that I wanted to quote from the commission report. Before I do that, I'm sure everyone in this room is very familiar with the book, The New Jim Crow, <coughs> by Michelle Alexander. And that's what we're talking about, racial equity in the correctional system. Again, my name is Jacqueline Fonseca, and I'm also representing the Harriet Tubman Project, a program created inside of MCI Local by a group of life groups. I'll be speaking in support of the House Bill H3956 and Senate Bill S1545, an act creating an independent correctional oversight office to facilitate the recommendations of the Special Legislative Commission on Structural Racism and Correctional Facilities of Congress. I want to thank you, Senator um, Eldridge and former Rep. Nico Dorado, for putting your jobs on the line, working with the incarcerated men at the African American Coalition Committee of MCI Norfolk to publish the December 2022 report. My testimony will be largely quoted from that. Quote, structural racism manifests in Massachusetts corrections as systemic racism when race disparities in the external criminal legal system outside of the walls are imported into corrections. The classification system is one example of a correctional system that compounds structural racism carried over from outside because of its reliance on the unfair sentencing produced by structural racism in the courts, end quote. That's from the commission report. During yesterday's public safety hearing, we heard an overlapping theme insisting that the HOCs and the DOCs are severely understaffed more correctional officers are needed. We've also recently heard the DOCs continuously insist that a $50 million new women's prison is necessary. According to Mass Inc.'s criminal justice reform in Massachusetts, a report that was just published yesterday, quote, there are almost 6,000 fewer individuals in the state prisons, jails, and county houses of correction today compared to 2017, end quote. Earlier today, it was also reported that MCI Concord will be closing by the summer of 2024. With crime rates at an all-time low and the population of incarcerated people quickly declining, why do we need more prisons and more correctional officers? Recent reports from prison legal services have taught us that it costs taxpayers an average of $134,000 a year per incarcerated resident. That's more than the college tuition to send our kids to for a better education. I can't say for sure, but about 1% has been reported to be spent on rehabilitative program. 1% out of $134,000 a year of your tax paying money is going to rehabilitative program. With limited re rehabilitative program in the DOC, who is actually receiving access to those programs? Referencing back to the December 2022 report, quote, structural racism manifests in Massachusetts correction and corrections as institutional racism, mainly through policy, end quote. Remember the classification system that over sentences BIPOC communities? Well, most of those defendants were given life without parole sentences and the DOC's classification policy says lifers are at the bottom of the rehabilitative programming list. So if you are a lifer, you don't get access to rehabilitative program. The DOC confidently shared yesterday that some people are unable to be rehabilitated. This is true. When we don't make access to programming equitable, when people are expected to die in prison and deny opportunities to learn, how can they change? <laughs> As recently as a week and a half ago, over 300 lifers were finally given the chance to see parole, since science has proven it is unconstitutional to sentence juveniles to death by imprisonment. So what program has these now 40 plus year old men and women been engaging in the past two to three decades to prepare them to integrate back in society today? The program they've created for themselves, that's it. The DOC's vision statement states, to, effective, po to affect positive behavioral change in order to eliminate violence, victimization, and recidivism. That's their vision. The only positive change I've ever witnessed in my work behind the walls, in my personal experience with those behind the walls, has been a change of residents 
that create that change within themselves and encourage it amongst others, like Mac here. Reportedly, one-on-one -on -one interactions between the staff and BIPOC incarcerated people can disproportionately impact disciplinary decisions, experiencing over-policing based on race or skin color and receiving harsher discipline than white counterparts. And you heard my brother here mention that. Some BIPOC staff express feeling unsafe. We're talking about the CO, this is how they feel. Unsafe, discouraged, or unsupported in addressing their own experiences of racism or acts of racism they've witnessed towards others, including incarcerated persons. In confidential settings, some white staff administrators cooperate with incident or suspecting staff of pressuring other staff to keep quiet about incidents of racism. They're not only racist to those incarcerated residents, but they're racist to each other, and they are encouraging and pressuring one another to keep the, the code of silence. This is a very familiar tactic that's used on the streets. This is called interpersonal racism, which leads to the issue of internalized racism. The commission found that regardless of race, the corrections culture generally normalizes an us versus them mentality. My point is this, the us versus them mentality is then mirrored in the streets and without proper oversight in the correctional facilities to implement the recommendations that were made in the December 2022 report, the cycle of hurt people hurting people continues on the streets. If we, the taxpayers, are paying for the rehabilitative programming as a public safety measure, then we want to see the results when they are returning to our communities. Because all I see right now is our black boys and girls being over-sentenced, commonly wrongfully incarcerated. My gross and net never see eye to eye. And no real oversight on how my tax money is actually being used behind the walls. So please consider the oversight bill H3956 and Senate Bill 1545. Thank you. initiative. Uh, one thing that I, I want to start off and be you know, quite candid is that I served 33 years, mostly for a crime I did not commit. So I literally grew up in the Department of Corrections. And when, as a 17-year-old, until being released in September 22, um, the September 1st. So when I say that I'm a student of policies and practices and procedures, I tell you, I've learned this firsthand, and it gave me the ability to be able to navigate and understand the atmosphere in which I came under, right? So I wanna first give you an understanding that what we're asking today in regards to oversight is not a brand new idea. Oversight actually existed prior to Governor Well, and it was quite effective, right? It ensured when the Department of Correction was being supervised by Health and Human Services, it ensured that every program functioned in the way that it was and that everyone had access to those programs. When the change occurred under Weld, well, the first thing he dismantled was the oversight committee, right? Because of his own penal ideology, which was he was gonna reintroduce us back to the joys of breaking rocks, right? Which means he was gonna create a condition of warehousing in the prison. And that mentality has really, really built for the last three decades. Yep. And stripping all the programs and services behind, all determining who has access to those programs and services, right? The very, the very least ones that still exist. I think what's been the most complicated thing for me as a person who survived this experience who taught other men, who've also been engaged, is to witness these things in and out, right? I've seen correctional officers come here yesterday and spoke, and some of them of color being supportive, but no one talks about the real condition of them being discriminated, right? And if you check every, every facility, just to support what I'm saying, 
every facility, you'll find that the 11 to 3 shift is made up of mostly black and Latino officers. And if you was to talk to them why, they would tell you because they do not or cannot deal with the racism that exists on the two other ships, the day ships. This is a fact. And only someone like me would know this because I grew up in the system and know how it operates. Here's another thing that I want you to understand just in the hypocrisy of it all, right? Here I am, the Department of Corrections, or excuse me, the parole, parole me after 22 years, I mean, excuse me, 33 years, and then said I was rehabilitated, I've been released of almost every restriction under that condition, and now out here functioning as a citizen, law-abiding citizen in the capacity in which I serve today, right? And then part of my job is to go back into the facility and to actually deal with the brothers and the sisters to make sure that they're getting services and to figure out initiatives to prevent this type of structural racism from occurring, right? Make sure that they get access to programs and services like they're supposed to. Yet, the Department of Corrections have said that I cannot have access to the facility based on my history, my disciplinary history. Now, I want you to process that. My disciplinary history, but I'm allowed to be in the open society, right? I've been determined by, the, by at least the parole to be rehabilitated, but that rehabilitation means nothing about me going back into actually advocating. And what they're saying to me is really that they don't want me back in the role in which I was receiving those disciplinary, which was assisting, building program support behind the wall because we were not offering programs while we were here. Now, here's where it becomes incredible for me, right? Because I witnessed, and I love the fact that our uh, public safety hearing had incarcerated folks stuff. The uh, judicial proceedings had uh, brothers and sisters talking at there and giving their own lived experience. So I am not out here alone, and people cannot say that I'm what I'm saying is unsupported by the what's happening on the ground day in and day out, right? But then, for this meeting, it has to deal with solely the issue of the black and brown folks and the way policy offends them or discriminates against them. First, they start off with the measure of just having one. What was the excuse that they provided to us? They said, because I want to just make this clear on the record, right? We asked for those men and women to be present, to video feed just like they was in every other entity as you heard the state rep, Erica uh, Ida Oven say, right? At the same time that they was approved for the public safety, the, the excuse was that, oh, we have to notify the victim's family, as if the first notification wasn't deemed enough for the next day. Public safety hearing was just yesterday. What's, what's different about today? Are they gonna take offense for them not uh, applying today? This is type of circular reasoning that they give us day in and day out when you're in the institution for reasons why you can't have what you're entitled to. But yet now they do it at large to show you that they have no respect when it comes to these type of particular issues. And the real concern, right, is that in, inclusive in this issue is the oversight. They do not want that. Now, I don't want to belabor it. I want, I really want everyone in, in this room to truly understand the challenges that these men and women are up against, right? And I, and I don't want people to underestimate, you know, as if we're saying that everybody in the Department of Corrections is bad. That's not, that's not what we're saying here. We're saying that you have those who are forcing this narrative about what what the penal institution should look like, and they're exercising that narrative at the detriment of black and brown folks who have to come back out into our society unprepared, and then if they 
do commit an act, they get to stand back, hands off, and say, oh, that didn't have nothing to do with us. No one's talking about the trauma that they've experienced, the witnessing of abuse that they've experienced, the abuse that they themselves suffered. No one's talking about any of this. And then I'll tell you that they don't care because they there is no one to hold them accountable but the governor. So making a statement that they made today is evidence of what I've been saying all along. When it comes to black and brown issues, this is the way the Department of Correction feels. I think I'll close off by saying that I appreciate the fact that all of you are here those of you who could show up in person. And I appreciate the fact that by lending your ear, that I hope that you get behind this bill and actually move it out of committee. Because this is what needs to happen, and I can't stress enough, I can't emphasize enough, that men and women are dying. They are dying. And I'm, when I say dying, I'm not just talking about Physical, I'm talking about internally. And you want them to come out here and act like they're normal when they can't. They're not given the tools. And so this is very personal for me. I mean, the one brother that they did agree to, to, to feature, to showcase, you know, they said, we ain't even going to do that because they do not want the idea behind the wall to spread. What is that idea that you have any self-autonomy, any self-power when it comes to creating your own destiny? And is that inconsistent with our laws? No, it's not. In the statute itself, if you look up 127 section 20, which is the classification, it says Classification is individual to each person. Each person has a rehabilitative program designed for themselves, not for everyone, for themselves. And yet when we try to exercise that, they tell us, no, if it's, if it's made for or by, for whites, by whites, then, and I'm gonna say it candidly because that's what it is. That program that that brother, which is, you heard David talk about, that is, is for a white population of men who are coming in with drug addictions and been battling drugs addiction, but for men who do not have that experience, why are you putting them through that process? And I would tell you, Dale Bissonnette, who was a superintendent, was the first person to point that out, to say, if you send people there who are not, who do not have these problems, the studies say you will make them worse. And yet, they told him he must go. Now, everything I say is a matter of record. I always say, please, fact check me. Please, don't accept anything that I say. With that, thank you for listening. Thank you. And with that, I'd like to bring our chair Black and Latino Caucus, please put your hands up for Broadway. I think it's, it's been said, uh, I'll be real brief. Uh, you know, all the lawyers in here are fighting for this. I'm going to highlight four things. First of all, I'm a retired probation officer. I was a probation officer for 35 years before I retired. So I think I know a little bit about the criminal justice system. I've been going to jail for a long, long time. And the four things, and I always start with saying that probation, if you go back to the father of probation, it was John Augustus. Probation actually started in Massachusetts, in New York jail. It was probation for over almost right together. So John Augustus starts probation. For what? Rehabilitation. People were incarcerated, rehabilitated. The point of jail when you go in is to be rehabilitated. Now, that's the point. That's what it is. It's always been. We're going to flip the script.
Let me tell you about a lot of black and brown people. I'm going to say one more name, Willie Horton, 1988. Mike Tukak is running for president. George Bush won, is running against Tukak. Willie Horton was in, was in jail in Massachusetts. They had, used to have furloughs with Rep. Holmes and Jay. We've been fighting to bring furloughs back. You used to have furloughs routine. When you've been doing good in jail, you get the weekend, you keep going and going. Willie Horton goes out, he does something that's true. They take that, that becomes a national poster. And I think we've been paying for that ever since. When you say, well, in the clip, yeah, they're going to go back to chain game, basically, just bust the rocks. Remember that. John Augustus and uh, Willie Horton. The other thing, George Floyd woman. We got to a lot of stuff from VPW because of George Floyd. But what we did, we missed the opportunity. <coughs> we looked at Post, we looked at State Police, we looked at uh, 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 Regular Police. We didn't bring in chain game. We didn't bring in the penal system. We just, for whatever reason, there was a lot going on, a lot of moving parts. So we really missed an opportunity then because we got a post out of that. We got some real good things, structural commitment. And then the structural uh, probation and program, which is really wrapped, wrapped together. And I can tell you, we know that uh, when you're a black man or brown man in America, if they treat you the way they treat us outside the prisons, what do you think you can do when you get your hands out? Inhumane, and I'm always, I've, I've been going to jail, jail for a long time. And my thing is that, yes, I'm incarcerated. I'm still a human being. Treat me as a human being. That's the name. But you get a lot of correction officers that, you know, you know, in, in school and stuff, they probably were, you know, pushed around a little bit. They get in jail, they get a badge. Mm -hmm. Get a nightstick and get a lot of power. Now, when you can, when an individual person can look at you and roll your eyes at a guard, and then he can write you up, and you go into the hole. This is real talk. So I'm glad Chairman Gonzalez was here, who's been in the Black and Latino Caucus, who's chairperson of Public Safety and Homeland Security. We're going to push. You know, this bill is, it's judiciary has a piece of it in uh, uh, public safety and home has a piece of it. We're going to push hard to get it up. We know it's time. I'm preaching to the choir. We're going to get all the data stuff. I know the treatment that folks get when they're incarcerated, and it's not right. And they hide behind the prison walls. Now, we have asked for reform five years, Rep. Five years for data. Jane and we voted legislative to do, and they still haven't complied. We need oversight. We, we, we really need oversight. Just so, you know, that's like the, 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 the hen garden, the fox garden hen house. That's exactly what that is. When the fox is guarding the hen house, you know what they're going to do. They'll eat up all the hens. Exactly what they're going to do. And that's what these folks are doing. You know, you got some good people over there, but then the bad apples, I would hope that we could do what we did with Post. We have to have each police officer has to be certified. And if they get decertified, they get fired and they're gone. Mm -hmm. We're gonna have some tough, tough talk. So Attorney Whiteside, thank you for what you do, you and your staff. Appreciate you, and appreciate you folks' passion and your energy. Sometimes it's a thankless job. Because when you go to that prison, as the Reverend said, when you go visit you, everybody in town, I still get, they still write me all the time. And I try to respond because I know it's a lonely, lonely place. And we need to eliminate the dehumanization of people. It's for rehabilitation. That's the Constitution. That's what probation and parole is, to rehabilitate people. By their own laws. This is what they wrote. Now, we didn't write it. But you get a bunch of black and brown people, and all of a sudden, you know, they want to go back to before the Mayflower and treat you almost like a slave, basically. And treat you less than what they call us three fifths of a man. They make you one fifth of a man. This is real. It's not fun in here. Okay? So let's get behind this.
this. We got a lot of strong people. We want it needs to be done. And when they can tell us, the legislature, signed, sealed, and delivered, and after five years, nothing. That's pretty bold. That, that's, that, that's, that's pretty bold. I like to use a lot of language when I can. <laughs> that's pretty bold. I want to thank uh, folks. Uh, I know some folks from Springfield on the Zoom. Uh, my uh, brother Richard Johnson, thank you for all the work that you do, my brother. But, but I'm on. I signed. We're going to push, man. Because right is right. And here's the other piece. When you, this is not my language, this is the king's language. When you pay your debt to society, you pay your debt. That's what they say. You're free and clear, unencumbered. Now you can move on with your life. But when they tell a brother that you can be a member of society, but you can't come in here to help folks, that would make your job like you. Do you understand that? make their job a lot easier. So I know I did get a little emotional. I didn't carry away with this. But uh, it, it's passion. I, I, I've been doing this a long time. And, and prepare to do a lot longer. Prepare to do a lot longer. And thank all of them. I don't know you jumped in there and gave us some new energy. You yeah. need it. You <laughs> need that, Jamie. And thank you for you, too. And then and, and me and Jamie were talking. Some of the, he goes, some of these Republicans say, we do this for votes. Really? <laughs> really? Because of votes? I don't know how many votes you <laughs> People can't even vote when they're incarcerated. Think about it. We do this because of the passion that we have for what? That's like Spike Lee said, doing the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't have too much to add. That was incredible representative williams and uh, mac you were fantastic as well and and i would just say that um if anyone hasn't been to mac's full presentation on on a racy doing it across the state uh, uh there was one last night in worcester um, i'll be with you in acton this saturday there's one in springfield coming up and i could i could speak on each one of the speakers um that's already spoken today but i i would just say first of all i speak on behalf of myself and the rest of mary keith who had to go Really proud that the Criminal Justice Reform Caucus and the Black and Latino Legislative Caucus were able to do this event together. And, and thank you so much, uh, so, so many staff people here. Um, and I, I think uh, without repeating um, what, was, what was said about you know, what the bill does and why it's important is that, um, you know, Rep. Representative Williams talked about the fact that we voted for a lot of this data to be transparent uh, five years ago in the Criminal Justice Reform Package. You know, this morning, uh, some of us were at the uh, Boston Foundation report on five years later, you know, what's the update? And, and, and some of the presenters, the researchers said, um, we can't tell you the whole picture because we're still not getting the data. We're still not, we still haven't gotten the data from DOC, from sheriffs, from, from other state agencies. That's a major frustration. That's a big part of what this bill would do. Um, Latoya uh, Whiteside did an absolute amazing job with the special commission on structural racism and correction facilities. I was proud to co-chair that with former representative Eligardo, uh, but Latoya really made it a much stronger document. But again, the frustration was we couldn't get enough data to do an even more robust report. And then to what Latoya talked about and Representative Eiderhoven talked about, and certainly my experience, now 23 years going into prisons uh, as, a, as a legislator is that um, I, I just think of what I met with the young man at, at Susan Baranowski uh, a couple years back who would say, you know, when, I, when I'm wrong, I'm wrong, or when I'm right, I'm wrong. And, I, and that's the problem with DOC, is that you, you're not getting a fair treatment if you're incarcerated, and, and legislators, advocates, we're, we're not getting the full information either as well. So that's the need for this independent oversight entity that has that power, because to what Representative Eiderhoven has been doing, Senator Miranda, Representative Holmes, you know, really all legislators here, going into these prisons, the reality is, whether it's because of our, you know, the, the challenges with our staff doing so much, uh, the, the fact that obviously legislators are doing so many different things on a daily basis is that it's hard to compile all this and, and, and paint a clear picture of how dysfunctional and, and how deeply troubling the DOC culture is, and that's, that's the power of this independent uh, oversight agency. So the data collection and that power to go in and, and really find out the truth. Um, so um, I, I, I want to thank everyone here who's involved and I, and I 
really just want to conclude, I think Rep. Holmes is going to finish the, uh, the, the program, but you know, what has changed since last year, right, is that we, we, we made some progress under Republican governor, and, and, and now we're obviously with the Democratic governor, and to, to what Max said earlier, it, it's, it's positive now incarcerated people are able to testify at hearings uh, through you know, virtual testifying, that's really good. Um, there's already been talk today about the sort of big news that's breaking as a Governor Healy announced today that MCI Concord is, is closing, so that prison is gonna be closed by June, speaking about the, the reduced numbers of people who are being incarcerated. Um, and I'm encouraged by Governor Healy's pardons. However, on the other hand, all these things have been talked about by all the previous speakers. You know, all these things are still happening, right? So they're still happening now. So if, if, if we have a Democratic governor, we obviously have overwhelmingly Democratic legislature. So now, you know, this change has to happen. Obviously the bill has to pass, the Criminal Justice Reform Caucus has prioritized it, but also, you know, we need stronger support uh, at the executive branch as well to make these real changes uh, that's directly impacting everyone. And you know, the, the thing that politicians talk about nonstop now, including a lot of white politicians, is racial equity, right? Well, this, this is, you know, target zero for racial, racial equity, and the reality is racial inequity now. So let's get it done. Thanks so much for being here. Good evening, everyone. Afternoon. I'm going to just wrap it up by simply just saying one simple thing, and that is things that get measured get done. Just that simple. That's what this is about. We need to start to measure. You can't go and um, make decisions if you don't actually know what the answers are. And so, just when you think about it in practice, uh, whether or not it be in sales, whether it be um, particularly in the sales, I think that's coming off the when they show you your numbers and, and you know, uh, you, you can talk a lot of games, but if you don't actually have the numbers to back it up, it's not real. And so when Latoya and PLS and the entire team uh, pull things together, if we're not measuring this, then there's no real answer that we can go and solve. And so that is what this is really about. It's about measuring and using facts. There's a lot of other things that people can say, but that's what this is. The second thing that I think is important, I remember, because uh, Matt mentioned incident that happened yesterday uh, with testifying. Um, when we have the incident at Sousa inside of the, uh, with the injury with the question officer, one of the things that uh, I, I said is interesting how all of a sudden that video came out very quickly, right? And so it should be the same standard, right? So if, Eric and I were talking, I think just the other day, um, if if a video is released in two days, if, it, if you think it's a bad to you, then that should be fine. If a, a video is released in two days, but it might be a disadvantage for you, that's exactly the way it should be. So all we're asking for is to measure things. When did you release that video? When is, why is it so hard for me to get, rid of, get the video that we think is positive? Or, or communicate something different? And so this is all about measuring things. That's what it's about. The second thing is, it's, it's truly about what to say. When we had the incident happen at, um, at Tuesday, Many of us legislators went up there to kind of have a conversation, including at the time, the majority leader who's now the speaker. And one of the things that Speaker Mariano said at the time was, wait a minute, when you have a dispute, you have a disagreement, you have a report, and you go and you put a petition, a petition in against the correction officer, where does the end result land? Who makes the ultimate decision? And everything still stays within the Department of Correction. Right, so eventually at some point, uh, Commissioner Michi will make the decision, whether that be something against the president officer, whether that be against someone who's a top three. And that's what we're saying. When the, when the representative said the Fox should not be watching the hen house, clearly Mariano uh, at the time had said, as the majority leader and now the speaker, noticed the same thing. And he said, wait a minute, should this now reside in the attorney general's office? That's all we're asking for. We want some independence, right? We want someone to look at this that is not in the um, DOC each and every day. So we want measuring, things that get measured get done. So that's what, if you guys are gonna remember something, please remember that. We want to measure things. We can no longer just have stories, anecdotal, this is one off, this is that. We want to be able to measure what is actually happening so we can compare it. And then remember, even though uh, he said it already, don't have the Fox watching it in-house, 
we need to make sure that there's oversight that is independent. You're gonna hear a lot of things about what this bill does, but that's really what it's doing. And finally, I wanna just give a shout out to all of the folks who uh, were able to participate that were formerly incarcerated. I know we didn't get Kupuan on. I uh, wanna have a conversation about just why there are differences between yesterday for 30 people being able to testify, be in the court, and not today, not have it. That's another debate that we'll have on another day. When I talked to Chairman Gonzalez, I think nine different um, prisons, people from nine different prisons were able to testify and be recorded. Now all of a sudden one person from one prison can't be recorded, we'll work on that. But the, the thing that is so important for me is when I see you back and I see all the folks who are testifying, my most important thing is to say to you guys, I'm not here to speak for you. All you have to do is go into AACC or go into any meeting. You guys are the most powerful speakers I know for yourself. I don't need to speak for you. And I've said over and over again, what you need to make sure you use, Kit, me, Erica, Bud, uh, Jamie, all of us should be your amplifier. I keep saying that. And I hope you guys keep hearing. Like, you guys know uh, when you get home, you can, you can stick the cord to the amp and it gets a lot louder. That should be our job. It, it, don't let other people speak for you like you did today. It is so great to see you come here and speak for yourself. Speak for yourself. And all we're trying to do is to, on Zoom, on, on legislative briefings, in hearings, be the amplifiers to come out and so you can advocate for yourself. Because the problem is, so much of what has happened has been because of the fact that, I know he talked about Willie Horton, but also the fact that you guys decided years ago that you would all of a sudden uh, have a pact, create a political pact. Mm -hmm. And a political pact then That's led, right. like so, your activism to say that I want to be more civically involved and create a pact then leads to the fact that you're now not able to vote. So just think about just how, the, just the dichotomy of that, that right. you were civically involved and this entire commonwealth moved to the opposite direction <coughs> to eventually make it so you're least civilly involved. And so all we're doing now is just breaking the system that was broken and making it and creating these possibilities for you guys to, to be more active. And so when I arrived here 13 years ago, Jamie's 23 years old, I don't know what the exact number was, but there were 11,723 people in our state prisons. That number's cut in half, cut in half. And in our county prisons, it was about 12,500, literally cut in half. So as I say to the AACC and I'm saying to you guys, you're here, show up in this building, you're on the streets now, right? Dial, instead of calling my office, instead of calling Bud's office, I say call the speaker's office, right? Call, you, all, you all got phones, you all can call anybody you want. Call the Senate President's office. Stop spending all your time with the folks who are already on your side. That's right. Stop working with us. I, I, I keep saying it in every team. There are 200 people in this building. You got like, some of us, you, you had it at low, as they say, as they say, you had me at the low. <laughs> you had me at the low. Go work the guy who you don't have. Stop living in my office. <laughs> Just put your coat up in my office if that's all you need to do. Stop there for a moment. But go and work this building. Go work the building and, and tell your story. And because you can't just say everybody's incarcerated because half of you guys are out that was already locked up. And so you're doing wonderful things. And I'm not going to say you're not. But the thing that works in this building most is people seeing you and telling your own story. So that's what I'm going to say just to everybody. Public is online and everyone here. I expect to see you guys in this building. We own this building. All you got to do is come to the security and go any way you want. Well, not anywhere, but most places you want, right? <laughs> right, we're gonna stop you from, you can't just come to my office whenever you want, man. You know, there's somebody gonna stop you, but you get the point. Knock on the door, make yourself known, because when I walked out of here, when I walked into this meeting, there were some seniors who didn't know me. They say, you look like a state rep. I am. They say, hey, we got a climate justice bill we wanna to talk to you about, right? Just walk this building. You bump into somebody, hey. I was with, with Sam yesterday, I said, Sam, you come here lobbying me on this stuff? What's this guy do with black people? He said, I'm lobbying about this today. Okay, okay, this is your lobby today. Because, you know, everybody got their own thing. Right. Lobby this building. Lobby it. Work it. Just the fact that you guys are here. So thanks for being here. Thanks for being a part of the process. Thank you, Latoya, and the whole team. Let's give them a round of applause for you. <laughs>